that guy. Thank you. Super. I'm hearing a laptop. Maybe just bring that volume down. Super. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Concordia University's Force Space. Thank you for joining us for today's event. Panel discussion with Concordia and McGill students from the residency Reactive Graphene Oxide. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Force Space. And here we are located on unceded Indigenous lands in Chijage, Montreal. And a force space, as you know, probably by now, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge, co-create daily activities, events that examine research questions at the university. We're running today's event as a live stream meeting. We welcome comments and questions in the chat if you're on Zoom. But those of you who are in the space and you want to participate, we'll get a microphone to you. And with that, it is now my pleasure to hand this over to one of the residency leaders, researcher Alice Jari. Uh, thank you, Doug, um, and welcome to our presenters. Uh, we're really happy to have uh, you, wonderful graduate students, uh, around the table uh, for this discussion. So uh, this discussion stems from a research project that's co-led by my colleague, Marta Ceruti from Materials Engineering uh, at McGill's and myself in Design and Computation Arts. So it's a project at the interface of Design and Material Science uh, that brings together artists, scientists, uh, and where we develop a reactive membranes and object using graphene oxide. So graphene oxide uh, is a layer-based uh, nanomaterial that's derived from the oxidation and exfoliation of graphene fight. And it can also be synthesized from uh, waste. Um, so the project spans different technical, uh, philosophical, material, technological question. Uh, and, and we ask uh, questions that are both relevant to uh, design, art, uh, and engineering. Uh, and we ask, up to which point can materials mimic nature, become alive, uh, changing themselves based on external stimuli? What happens when material uh, and humans interact? Can the interaction between materials and the environment help improve our own environment? So for this, we developed a project over more than uh, two years now, and we are really happy to uh, host this residency uh, at Four Space during a full week. Uh, so this panel this morning is an opportunity for students to share their research, uh, which deals with graphene oxide, but not only. Uh, and we also extended the invitation to other uh, to other artists presenting uh, in the exhibition, the comments that's hosted here at Ford Space and in the EV building. So from left to right, my side, here we have uh, Jacob Landry, filmmaker in the project, but also uh, alumni in film production. We have Nora Gibson, Jacqueline Beaumont, Yuan Chen, Brissa Marcuja, Nima Zakeri, and Philippe Vandal. Uh, the way we're going to organize the, the event today, uh, each uh, presenter will uh, discuss their research for four minutes, and then we're going to have a Q&A and a discussion among us to discuss collaboration, challenges of interdisciplinarity, opportunities, specific aspects of your research, and uh, we're really curious to know more. Thank you. Because you have uh, the laptop. Okay, so maybe uh, who would like to start? You, when do you want to start? I can. Yeah. So don't forget to share your screen on Zoom. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Yuan Chen, a postdoc researcher uh, from McGill University. So today I'm happy to share uh, some experience on graphene oxide assembly and how we interact with this material. So since uh, I'm today's first presenter uh, for this topic, I would like to introduce a little bit, bit more uh, about what's graphite. So uh, graphene, basically uh, graphene is a single layer of carbon uh, extract from uh, graphite. And it has so many interesting features and thing light, transparent, strong, conductive, can be used as filter. And more interestingly, um, 
they can interact with many different kinds of inorganic or organic matters. So it's never a boring or inert material. The specific uh, directive of graphene we work with is graphene oxide. As Alice just introduced, graphene oxide has uh, uh, oxygen atoms on top of uh, the graphene flakes. So basically, uh, in that way, we can uh, deal with uh, this material just in solution and use these flakes as uh, those building blocks for structures that we desire for. And in my scientific research, I uh, produce several different kinds of structures based on graph graphene oxide um, for different applications, such as tissue engineering or seawater splitting into energy, uh, like hydrogen, oxygen. And uh, I also investigate how to uh, control their assembly, uh, like uh, aggregation or dispersion with heat. So when we uh, bring our knowledge from uh, lab to this art science uh, collaboration uh, project, so we were particularly interested in this responsive feature of uh, graphene oxide. So GO can absorb water and then expand. So if we put another inert layer of plastic adhering this to this GO, this volume expansion difference will induce this movement of uh, our bilayer film. However, we know that Montreal summer, the humidity is uh, quite variable. So this uh, uh, responsiveness, it's quite, this movement is quite like subtle. So we turn into another kind of thing that we can do like we do in words. So we are uh, using heat to remove some water from a GO layer. So the GO layer uh, shrink and induce this movement much more uh, fast. And interestingly, we can just direct, directly use light to induce this moment because uh, GO can absorb light and, trans, uh, and turn into heat. And then it's basically can mimic this blossom uh, activity like flower under the sun. And uh, to do that, we tried multiple ways to produce a, a bilayer film as uh, large as we can. And then we also interacted this uh, geo material just to use it as a, a, as a uh, ink to paint the small artwork that we can do. And we had a lot of fun. So another thing that we're very interested into is about the filtration feature of the graphene outside. And uh, tree is actually an excellent um, example of uh, how nature like filtered air. And we use a backup fiber that's uh, extracted from banana leaves uh, to mimic the branch of the tree and the geo flakes to mimic the leaves and capture the dust particle. And we bring our knowledge from lab to produce different architectures like in this uh, filters of based on graphene oxide and a backup to manipulate the, to turn this filtration feature. And some just uh, very quick, conclusion. So graphene has so many interesting properties and geoassembly leads to several different uh, architecture design and applications. And beyond lab research, geo interacts with water, heat, light, us, and ecosystem. So I'd like to thank our collaborator and our founding resource and thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Beaumont. I'm a biomedia designer and I'm a first year in the individualized MA program here at Concordia. Um, my, my 
practice kind of, uh, well, it originates from a background in 5% material practices, and uh, I've been working with the chair in critical practices and materials and materiality for three years, working on different ways to integrate artistic practices uh, in fibers and material practices within more uh, material uh, science related areas. But um, my, my personal research um, is uh, my, my thesis, uh, Growing Affinity is a biomaterialist analysis of the transsexual body within popular media and material culture. Um, but I, I won't go too much into my own personal stuff, but uh, I think for today, I'm just gonna focus on what I've been working on with um, the group, oop, sorry, technical difficulties. Here we go. Um, so yeah, abaca is a species of banana plant indigenous to the Philippines. It's commonly uh, used in industrial craft paper making. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think originally when we first started the project, I uh, I was coming into the project as a paper maker. And so I wanted to kind of integrate some of the more um, inert uh, properties of fibers uh, and try to highlight them in a way where they can be able to uh, take a new form and try to uh, make us question how we could possibly use a material differently. Um, so I wanted to kind of utilize Abaca's long barky structure um, that would kind of take the, the filter from a 2D format to a 3D format. Um, so yeah, uh, and along the way we found that Abaca has been used in um, studies uh, that pertain to having heavy metal extraction from water. Uh, so we found that it was probably going to be a great opportunity to work with this material. Um, further, we would work on um, trying to build different scaffold structures that uh, we could use in different artistic interventions, moving towards architectural um, formats for air filtration. And uh, then as we started working with the group here at uh, McGill um, in material engineering, we, uh, oh, I mean, this is the filter of, um, that we've worked with uh, for another project we have with the chair, um, but it's, this is what it naturally does with uh, just uh, highway dust or like air from the highway. Uh, being caught in the filter naturally, but moving into graphene oxide, as Yiwen was talking about, uh, we were interested with this idea of expanding the surface area of the abaca and kind of using it as a scaffold structure in and of itself. So, um, so yeah, and uh, I think that's about it for me um, because I only have questions. All right. Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. And my name is Nora Gibson. I'm a third year master's student here in Intermedia. And I'm also uh, the prof here for um, introduction to digital media. 
Um, I am a new media artist and a choreographer and a researcher. My main interest uh, for my research is in questions of consciousness and being and the experience of being. So because I had a long career in dance, originally I started dancing professionally at 13 and uh, danced and choreographed basically um, most, most of my career. I have a very uh, deep connection with the body. So I would say that my material is very much the body in conjunction with these questions related to consciousness. So the type of work that I do does range from, um, I, I still do work in movement, but I think of the body in a much more abstract way. And I'm interested in the non-tangible aspects of our body. So for instance, our minds and the, the substance of that and whether that is a non-dual substance in 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 collaboration with the body and with other bodies um, and also the data that we can extract from the constant movement within our bodies and so I use this data physiological data so from our brains from our hearts our electrodermal activity we're just these constant moving electric beings and i i capture this and i use this material to animate visual experiences using programming as well as sonic experiences and i sometimes scan the body and movement as well when i wish to have a physical representation of of the body's form so this is i'll just i have some pictures uh, to give you a sense of the type of work that i do um this uh, that's the same work um uh that was uh courtesy of Hexagram, who I am so pleased that they brought uh, this work uh, to Ars Electronica um, this past September. It was an interactive piece um, involving a, a particle system and music or sound that was being um, driven and animated by the uh, either my or the audience's brain activity so they could sit and have a nice feedback loop with themselves as they um yes had this uh uh well relaxing experience <laughs> um so and the point of the work was really to it's not a such an intellectual process for, for me i i really i'm using my body to create a feeling in another person's body and um, and that doesn't happen cognitively. I think it happens sensorily. So anyway, this is another example where I used captured movement data and sound, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, brain activity to generate a new body, a but butterfly-like bilateral body. So I was working with the idea of transplanting my body into another kind of abstract body. Um, this is uh, an, just another example. Other examples. It's where I use my actual, actual form. Um, this is just an old picture from work that I choreographed. So it's still, still very much in me. The beauty of of the body. So. Um, Yes. So anyway, these are the types of materials that I that I use all sorts of physiological data and then different methodologies um, that that I use to bring the sense that these experiences are the sense of experiences to life. I think I have a couple a minute or so, but the, I just wanted to speak briefly about the piece that I have in this exhibit. Um, I was um, uh, really interested in the work of Sir Roger Penrose and Dr. Stuart Hameroff. They are bioquantum, well, one is a, a working in the emergent field of bioquantum physics, and the other is an anesthesiologist, and they were developing a theory on consciousness that was so very interesting that in, envisioned a non-local um, 
a, a vision of uh, of consciousness where um, you're where there's quantum activity that's happening uh, within the within the body, uh, but also within space time itself. So. Um, I was really inspired. It's a very complex um, theory, so I don't have the time to go into it, but that is a, a, just a horribly cursory uh, a view of it. And um, so anyway, um, uh, yeah, I spoke about biodata as a non-tangible uh, aspect of the body. So I took this biodata and then I, um, I, uh, from my gamma waves, and then I converted it to MIDI data and then created a sound score. So there's a suite um, of music that's on display, and there's actually a two channel video uh, installation that I do have a link do have a link for um, that accompanies that I can just show you like ten seconds of. If it buff if it does if it stops buffering, I can show you ten seconds. And ah, uh, ah, uh, thank you, thank you. And there's no sound, but um, but uh, and the resolution is quite poor, but but um, this is a it's a two channel video installation that accompanies the work which runs for 10 and a half minutes so um yeah that is uh i think that's all i'd like to say now thank you so much it makes more sense than to go to the other side of the table and then back so okay How did you find the quick event button? I never did. Oh, um, good enough. This will work. Yeah. All right. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit different because I'm not a master's student and I don't necessarily consider myself a researcher either, but uh, <laughs> my name is Jacob Landry. I'm a filmmaker and videographer, and I graduated with a BFA in film production from Concordia last year. Uh, I'll just quickly go through some of the different aesthetic things I work with. I started in fiction film. I did a couple of short films, usually with some horror elements. Get that out of the way. Yeah, some some sort of horror element or just silly things to learn the medium and to entertain myself, basically. Um, oh my god. So this was the film that I made as a portfolio film to get into Concordia as my bachelor's. It was about um, some people that find some gold in a field and then they are haunted by vengeful spirits that turn them into ghosts, like from a Halloween costume. This I made in my first year of my undergraduate. It's another horror -y type film where She pulls her inner monologue out of her head. And then uh, when the pandemic started, I started working with found footage a lot because it was difficult to shoot things. So I found I needed, you know, material that I had the rights to that I didn't shoot. So that was for me like home movies. So I digitized all my old VHS tapes and I started making narrative experimental narrative films this one's a uses like these old videos shot on a farm to sort of tell the story of a mysterious disappearance uh this one is the most ascetic 
one so far it's just one shot that sort of plays over and over again and loops on itself and uh has iterate more like it's iterative uh i think i've also worked as a crew member on a couple of different roles the first is the first assistant director which i found out i really do not like because you're you're basically like the killer of dreams you just you tell the director what they don't have time for what's not in the budget like what they can't do so i didn't like that position very much but i have also worked as an art director and i really really like that i've done a couple things it usually ends up very 50s uh but that is a style that is very fun to try and recreate uh, I'm also a videographer. I shoot concerts and I shoot sports. And that's uh, important for this role because I never know if I should call myself a filmmaker or a videographer in reference to what I do on this project because it's it's like a documentary. It's like pure documentation. And I'm definitely trying to be as um, real and direct as possible. So when I was approached for this position, I put together a little um, presentation on my artistic goals for this project. And there were like five tenets that I stuck to, which was a direct cinema aesthetic. And also, I guess you could call it a direct cinema approach with, you know, small crews, like an unobtrusive camera crew in order to capture the laboratory as accurately as it would be like on a normal day and represent it truthfully well in in air quotes because that's you know impossible but and you know other, other things like i didn't want to have too many faces i wanted to really emphasize the hands the sort of the like tactility the sort of material practice like how it almost looks like painting or cooking or something that people understand and relate to um and then i had a few visual touchstones like old uh, factory films and like photography that emphasizes hands and some direct cinema examples and from there i just started filming what goes on in the lab and then editing that into uh the documentary that's playing in the in the gallery right now uh as you can see, I have like almost 600 gigs of footage at this point. So it's definitely the biggest project I've ever undertaken. And it's just very daunting to put it all together in a way that makes sense. Now that's all for me. Um, hello everyone, my name is Brissa Marcoja, I'm a graphic designer and an artist. Uh, I'm currently a PhD student at uh, Concordia University and, uh, and SAD Lab in Paris. Uh, I have a background in graphic design and I had the chance at one, some, at one point to uh, do my master in a material uh, surface lab and I kind of, I did fall in love uh, with materials 
And this is uh, what I'm working on now. So what we see in the background is uh, actually the type of things that I'm working with. I'm really fascinated in how does inorganic material can mimic uh, things that are alive. And I'm interested in what kind of relations that can build uh, with the uh, humans. Um, in my PhD, uh, I've been interested in, in different instruments for, for quite a long time. We've been, humans have been fascinated in different instruments to navigate spaces, but also to kind of detect what's invisible. So on the, on the left, the dozing road to kind of try to seek uh, water, the middle detector to find things that are not perceptible to our senses. And of course the sextant, that's a tool that was used uh, by sailors to, to navigate. And, uh, the kind of things that I'm interested in to detect are heavy metals. So uh, we're not talking about music, right? We're talking about materials that are sometimes hidden uh, in souls. So I'm interested in uh, those residues and their impact on the environment, but also on, on humans. And uh, as they're invisible, my whole PhD is to try to animate them and to understand how we can make them more visible and how we can uh, amplify their presence uh, in uh, different environments. So the environment that I'm working in is uh, Le Champ des Possibles, which is a former marshalling yard located in the Milan district of Montreal. We can see the railway on the right part. And what we can see also is that uh, this space that has been left over for many years has now a return of uh, um, plants and animals. And all these elements tends to invisibilize the fact that the souls are actually contaminated. So my PhD lies in kind of three different works so far. The first work that's called Symphony of the Stones in reference to a very beautiful place in Armenia that I recommend you to visit. Uh, the heavy metal sensing machine and uh, the third part, the archive, which is more like a documentation of the different works that I've been doing. Uh, the first part was an exploration uh, of uh, Le Champ des Possibles in which I did develop different set of installations that were interacting with the soil. So we're talking about heavy metals, but most of these metals, uh, lead, arsenic, zinc, they also carry out with them uh, magnetic particles. And by triggering different interactions with magnetic fields, I'm kind of able to create animation uh, from these materials. And the first uh, batch of experimentation that I've been doing there a year ago was a walkable uh, exhibition and round table that I did along with Philippe Vandal that's next to me. And uh, the whole purpose of that exhibition was trying to understand what it means uh, for human and participants to see soils moving, to, to see all these materials that are anima inanimated uh, coming into life. The second part of the experimentation is uh, the development of artwork slash instruments that actually helps you uh, navigating the space and that triggers different interactions, uh, sensorial interactions, so visual, haptical, and uh, sound based interaction to kind of feel and understand where the contaminants are in different places. So the whole work is based on amplifying what's already in the environment, but that are sensory apparatuses as humans cannot uh, seek. And the last part uh, will just kind of invite you to come tomorrow. I'm doing self-promotion now because uh, this work will be exhibited uh, tomorrow at Union Francaise uh, in Montreal, uh, along with Philippe Vandal. Uh, we will present a set of experimentation that were based on the exploration of this site. And uh, the installation that I will be presenting there is uh, kind of a wrap up of uh, the whole, all the experimentations that I've been uh, conducting on the Champ des Possibles. So I guess I will just give the mic to Phil now because uh, our, rela our works are quite uh, linked in a way. And thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Phil. I'm a BFA Intermedia Cyber Arts alumni, and I'm 
doing my sec I'm starting my second year in the MA in the program. Um, throughout my BFA, it seemed like I was a bit obsessed with scientific instrument or scientific looking small things. And for my master's, I think I'm still struggling to conceptualize what I actually want to do, but um, I'm interested in the aesthetics of scientific instrument, tools, equipments, and the different interfaces that do appear in the scientific protocols. I'm not doing science. I am just looking for the, um, not, I wouldn't say like the beautiful, but the pleasing aspect of those instruments and trying to combine into, um, yeah. Um, and so this is the, the things that I proposed for the Ecoton with Brice at uh, the Champs des Possibles. And there's this obsession about light that comes up right now, which is uh, around ultraviolet light. So a bit like a environmental forensics and there are um, they're everywhere <laughs> in my in my practice. Um, for the um, for the graphene oxide project, I did mostly um, a lot of programming, sequencing, activating, detecting, sensing, um, and um, that's it for me. Hello, everyone. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here as a part of this student-led session at Milieu Expo uh, and NEMA. I'm a second year PhD student at McGill University. Well, I'm just going to give you a little background about my PhD uh, project, and then I'm going to delve into what we're doing in a, collabor in a collaborative research work with uh, at the crossroad of art science co-creation process. Uh, well, in my PhD, project, uh, I'm focused on making uh, membranes based on graphene oxide responsive. Well, uh, membranes, as you may know, are uh, porous structures, porous material that uh, act simply, that could be uh, simply viewed as filters that act as some permeable uh, barriers, allowing the passage of specific molecules while blocking the other molecules. Well, uh, they, they have a wide range of applications from uh, biomedical applications to water purification, and it's a big industry. And interestingly, uh, graphene oxide can also act as a membrane. Well, due to its uh, unique structure and two-dimensional structure, it can self-assemble into uh, a laminar structure forming specific nanochannels and nanopores in between them, which this gives it a semi-permeable characteristic and can act as a membrane. In my PhD project, we're trying to basically uh, integrate and incorporate specific molecular agents that are naturally responsive to their environment, to specific stimuli like the acidity of the environment or the chemical properties of their environment with the graphene oxide membranes to extend this responsive characteristic to the whole membrane. Well, this is very important for us because it allows the uh, graphene oxide membrane to self adjust its permeability to different uh, molecules according to the needs of their environment. And as a potential uh, application for these systems, they can also act as a, a reservoir for specific chemicals like fertilizer. We can uh, basically integrate the fertilizers uh, with these responsive graphene oxide systems, and we can put them in the soils and up in the change in the, in the acidity of the soil uh, they can release, they can have an on-demand release of the fertilizer in the soil. And with this, we can kind of retrieve back the condition of the soil to the normal situation. In the same direction, well, here uh, in our collaborative research work, we're trying to assess the effect of graphene oxide and the plant growth. Basically, this comes from the fact that graphene oxide uh, has proven to be biodegradable material that can easily biodegrade into 
specific chemicals that naturally exist in the soil. But now we're running some experiments to see how graphene oxide affects the cells growth. Would they have any detrimental effect or they help them to grow faster? Well, based on the preliminary results that we have been given, uh, that we have been gotten from the from our experiments, interestingly, uh, it's been shown that the plants that have been cultured in graphene oxide solutions have shown a significant higher increase in the root growth compared to those which were uh, which were planted in the pure water. Well, uh, we definitely need to do some more research to specify the underlying reasons for this, but this was something uh, as of interest of us and was surprising. Yeah, this is it from my part. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for your fantastic presentation. I think uh, my colleague Marta has a first question. Thank you, everybody. It was really interesting to hear your work and uh, your collaborative work as well. I'll ask for a first question. I'll ask a general question you anybody can answer. I was curious to hear. I mean, some of you already said it explicitly, but um, some didn't. So I was curious to hear if you already had an interest in art for the scientists and science for the artists, filmmakers before coming into this collaborative project? And how did the participation in this collaborative project change your uh, view of what you wanna do in the future, wherever that's gonna be in art and science in anything? So. I can take this. Um, when I was doing traditional choreography for the stage, I had I was starting to collaborate with people from the STEM community. So um, uh, mechanical engineers, mathematicians, programmers, and um, and it made me very aware that the types of questions that I was interested in required a multidisciplinary approach. So, um, so that's what prompted me to, um, to start to shift um, into uh, either deepening those type of collaborations or just moving myself into allowing myself to participate in research that was beyond the narrow scope of um, my original field. So now the way I view um, what I'd like to be doing and developing in, into the future is I feel like specifically with the research question that I have uh, uh, regarding consciousness theories that, you know, since <laughs> Galileo, this, this issue has been split, but, you know, the scientific community, the philosophical community, and it's maybe no surprise that we don't have, um, that we don't have any certainty on what consciousness really is. So, I feel like as an artist, because our trade is in experiences, in the qualia of, uh, of, of being, that um, I'm perfectly positioned to be someone who's working toward um, these answers. So it allows me to see myself as, um, I guess, doing doing philosophy, but through through an aesthetic language and in concert with other thinkers, um, whether they're coming from a neuroscientific point of view or from a philosophical point of view. So I feel like I'm a, an essential um, a co researcher, a necessary co researcher in these kind of questions, while still maintaining um, the uh, my domain of, of aesthetic experiences. Thank you. I would absolutely also resonate with that as well. I think I, uh, I actually feel like I was more interested in science at the beginning um, rather than art. And uh, 
and it's so nice to be able to operate within both. Um, but yeah, I think there's something that happens when an artist is able to approach, um, I don't know, uh, science in a way where they're, as you were saying, sort of able to use the um, aesthetic analysis or the sort of um, feeling quality of being able to interact with this. But what what I what I came to realize as I ventured down this path further, it was always that what the feeling actually is, is naturally already, it's a biochemical response to the world around us. And, uh, and so I think that's, um, that's what I find so interesting about working with scientists and engineers is because they, they're able to uh, help to, we can co-navigate these sort of um, trying to untangle the the way in which we're perceiving and interacting with the world around us but uh yeah well, maybe i can share a little bit like i as a, a researcher like what i've learned from artists so basically uh when the, in in the lab we set a goal and for a certain application and then make hypotheses and test them and then uh, we produce uh, contribute like a material that's useful but like in this project uh, i particularly like uh found that in art we uh it's an expression and we need a uh, kind of awareness of how this material can interact with surrounding like people uh, as human like instead of just we pursue a certain goal out of this material so that's um very interesting uh, perspective for me because um, like material it's never like numbers and the data or a paper or a product it's a uh, it's living it's a uh, it's not only the responsiveness but also like talking to you like that's what I feel about like another aspect of graphene outside that a material that ha I have been working with so many years and I really appreciate that uh Thank you. Thank you. Um, what, what's interesting is in the question, I guess, and it's, it's a big question, is we say art and science, and we never really give a specification of what kind of science we're talking about. Uh, for many people as artists in universities, we're considered as part of social science which is really weird in many ways because I don't feel like I have a background in anthropology, ethnography or so forth. But uh, for some people, I guess we're considered as impactful on, on these type of fields. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's the most intriguing thing for me. Uh, do we talk about fundamental science or so social sciences? And then where do you put the arts into it? And uh, in now to come back a little more on the, what we call the collaboration. I, I always like to take reference in, in Jean-Paul Fomentreau, which did is a sociologist and he did a lot of analysis on what is the role of an artist in a lab, uh, in a lab in fundamental science lab, right? And uh, he says that there's three types of situation. The first being an artist that needs a technical support to make, to achieve something that is not able to do by himself, which is more like using scientists as engineers right uh the second situation would be an artist that is used by a lab to kind of promote uh, a discovery and the third one which is the most interesting i guess and it's the one i think you're talking about is merging different approaches and different background uh on working on the same topic to see how can artwork and knowledge emerge all together and i guess this is the the other situation right because First, you have to adapt yourself and your language. Uh, we talked about language yesterday, but uh, what is an interface, for instance, uh, if you're a software engineer, uh, if you're a material science or uh, engineer or, or an artist? So all these kind of questions, I think, are Thank intriguing. You. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, I have something to add. Uh, uh, well, we we frequently use the term the uh, art science collaboration. It kind of indirectly implies that 
there are two different persons, two different people, and we're trying to link them together. And uh, actually, I, uh, I want to bring up this question that uh, is science also could be, could science be an art too? And it goes back to which definition we consider for art. Well, in a simple manner, in a general explanation, uh, I could consider art as an act of creating. And in science, and part of science, probably in uh, not in that uh, field of science that we're going for the discovery of new things, but when in science we're engaging in creating new things, it's kind of we're going toward the same approach. Well, simply when we consider a specific artwork as an art, it's kind of indirectly means that we we assume specific elements for it. We have for e each kind of artwork, whether it is music, whether it is cinema or dancing, each artwork has specific elements. There's a content to be presented. There's techniques used to present those content. And also there's a form, how we put these things together. So in science also, when we try to bring new things into the world and to create new things, we have the same kind of, we can assume same elements for it to, we have a purpose, we have a content behind it. We use some techniques. And then the way we put the, these things together to create those, that purpose to uh, kind of reach that content is, is, uh, is we're going toward a similar approach, just the techniques that's probably scientists using are kind of different from the techniques that the artists using. And this, this kind of brings up this misconception misunderstanding that there are two different peoples. Uh, yeah, in my personal experience, I just found it, uh, I, it resonates more with what Ewan said and gave me a more holistic uh, approach toward what we're doing. Cause sometimes we're getting very detailed in analyzing different characterizations and getting into numbers, but we kind of lose on the, uh, the content side and the holistic side of the, uh, our projects. Yeah, this is it. Thank you. Well, thanks for for your answer. Uh, it's really interesting to to delve into this question of, um, you know, crossovers between artistic practice versus scientific practice, uh, and it touch base on the question of experimentation at the core of, I would say, different disciplines with material science, design, art, choreography, dance. And I'm just curious, um, in terms of, and I want to like ask more questions about collaboration because it's, as Brice mentioned, it's not necessarily easy. There are different models, there, there are challenges, there are roadblocks. Uh, so I, I'm just curious in, in your practice, whether in our collective research project, uh, the graphene oxide project or in different individual projects, what are the roadblocks that you experience in terms of, of collaboration? Uh, and how you adapted your methods for working? Who wants to delve into that question? <laughs> huh. Nima. <laughs> well it's a bit challenging because the the experiments that we've been running here is, is just uh to me we were trying to understand how graphene oxide affects the plants and it's more i'd say in a discovery spectrum of it's more to the science extreme of this this art science collaboration so uh i had a less chance of like having this interdisciplinary collaboration but in the beginning, when, when we started this project, it was a bit like, for me, challenging still to, to kind of accept the idea how we we're going to develop this scientific idea. That, to me, it was at the time was purely scientific. I didn't have any ideas how we we're going to uh, develop them as an art, artistic work. And like digesting this idea was a bit challenging for me at the beginning. And uh, also, uh, Another thing that as we started working on uh, the project together, uh, more on the artistic side, uh, I remember that we, we wanted to have a, a sample or a prototype already made to, to work on and to develop on, which is kind of a bit like, um, I wouldn't say contradictory, but it isn't 
that much similar to what we do. We used to do a lot of reasoning, a lot of research work be before just getting into a prototype in, uh, in the science side of it. Uh, yeah, this was the differences that I like experience and it was a bit like at the beginning challenging, but yeah, this is kind of thing that I had to adapt myself to. It. Yeah, you mentioned an interesting aspect about uh, the, uh, for example, if we take, we, we just take the the plant and the potas aspect, we know that we are going to conduct more tests and more like sampling and use different different plants such as strawberries and, and tomatoes yes. and and we decided to start this experiment with potos just to va validate i would say proto hypothesis that were yes or no will it work it was pretty experimental and and not necessarily planned in advance because it does it was all also thought of in terms of uh, visual and sensory dimension in in the gallery so exactly yeah, yeah. that's interesting Someone else wants to add something? Um, so when it comes to filmmaking, especially filmmaking with larger crews, um, there's a lot of roles on set that are extremely technical, scientific, like a cinematographer is really knowledgeable about optics, how lenses work, about lighting and like a gaffer knows about translucency, these kind of things, Think technical knowledge that translates into something artistic in the end. And often there's this sort of stereotype of the director as, you know, having their head in the clouds and having to be brought back to reality by the crew members with technical knowledge. I guess it's sometimes the case, but more often than not, the director also has enough of this knowledge to communicate on an even level, even-ish level with their crew members and come to a, a conclusion that is realistic and artistically satisfying to the director. I have a, a thought to add. Um, working with scientists, I became acutely aware of how incredibly useful <laughs> what what they what they do is um it's always their research is always for a very clear purpose and it usually has a very clear use and that made me really question what well the word usefulness um and what my use was as an artist like why am i doing a collaboration with a scientist who is busy accomplishing a very defined uh, end even if i understand that the path that the path doesn't necessarily follow the hypothesis exactly but um there is a utility typically that um i found mm, puzzling uh, and I started to have to reflect on that quite a lot as, as an artist. Um, so I, uh, Philippe was, you were talking about beauty and there's aesthetics. <laughs> You'd like to tone it down. Okay. I'll go for it. I'll go for it and say beauty. Um, that's an important, so aesthetics are important element to me. Beauty is an important element. And, uh, that's, um, I think it's a, it's it's a very powerful force that has a disarming effect on people and allows the, them to um, open or soften in a way that permits them to consider um, questions or issues that would otherwise perhaps be um, uncomfortable or scary or something to avoid. Um, so there's something about aesthetic qualities, if not beauty, other aesthetic qualities that put the your body or mind in a particular state that primes you for knowledge in a way that um, uh, that is uh, really important because you 
mm, people people can't grow unless they are in a state where they permit themselves to grow. So um, I feel like art is uh, for like the role of the artist for me in the collaboration is how can I facilitate knowledge through an through aesthetics because that's sometimes a, an impasse uh, even for uh, well I would say science and the general community is that you know perhaps this is knowledge that will be incredibly useful to a small uh, relevant group of people who are also interested in this particular area of research, but often the research is just so interesting um, in a general sense. So the, the art is what um, through, the, through the aesthetic language allows for the transmission of this language and allow uh, or transmission of these ideas, transmission of knowledge, and to and uh, primes the body and mind in such a way that uh, that that actually happens. So that's um, now how I've come to see my role in these collaborations as incredibly um, symbiotic in terms of um, um, the development of knowledge. Do you want to add something to the collaboration? Uh, yeah, there's a, we have another project and there's a running gag of me trying to make a wind turbine. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> but in, in this in this project on air quality, uh, we're collaborating with uh, Raman, which is a, an engineer. And uh, that was the, the, there was something curious because we were trying to take different signals from hair and we 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 assume that our energy harvesting through hair would be would be an interesting way of monitoring these signals and when i started to try to build that wind turbine which i have no idea how because i'm not an engineer and actually it doesn't it requires many engineers like mechanical engineers people specialize in energy harvesting and so forth and i just we we started to build up the whole thing and then Raman the engineer was like what well, you're you're doing you're not doing things the right way right usually we would like make all the calculations work as a team and then we will build the whole thing and it was like you build it and now I have to analyze what you've been doing and it was like that was interesting because it would be like it doesn't make sense at all but in the meantime it's quite interesting to try to understand what you've been trying to do on your own with the bunch of magnets and the 3D printer and then it was like that 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 does not make sense but it's interesting in the and and so we tried to to work on vertical wind turbine which is not a field really developed nobody goes for that because the 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 research is more on two horizontal turbine it was kind of interesting having all these exchanges with Raman being like it's it's really weird but it's interesting in the same way and I think just triggering interest from him was quite like it became kind of playful for him and very playful for us too, like trying to, you know, doing all these experimentation and just being like, no, it's just analyze this, see what we can do. And then, you know, you have to build the cause and it would be like, oh, just try 30 turns on the course. And I was like, why? And it would be like, I don't know, just try it out and we'll see. So, so the whole thing kind of, well, there's no real turbine right now, but we're <laughs> working on it. That's the running gag. Uh, but it, it kind of became a playground for both of us, not just us like being like, we need to make this, can you can you build it up? But more like an exchange on we're doing things and it's like, oh, change this, maybe that. And we all get interested to it. So I think that was also, a, but it kind of requires, I mean, it's an open question, I guess, but it kind of requires curiosity from the two sides, right? It's not a one direction relation, I guess. So it's, and that's where I think the language thing operates. How do you understand each other and collaborate and just not just ask help, but share uh, in two in directions. Hello, uh, thank you. This was uh, very interesting. I have a, well, another 
thing that comes to mind, it seems in, in terms of arts and science collaboration is the type of outputs, right, that can be produced and that can have their own life in different knowledge communities within and outside of universities. So I don't know the detail of your project, but I imagine that the, the manipulations that you've done together maybe were done differently than if you had done it in your lab with the kind of protocols you would have employed <clears throat> to go for a publication in, in, uh, in material engineering, right? I don't know the detail of, of your experimentations. Now I wonder, with the things that you have produced together, um, how do the different communities here represented, the artists, the scientists, and everything in between, how do you see taking what you've experimented with and going back? How do you, you produce images, you produce videos. Can you produce a publication? If so, in which kind of journal? I guess that would be a different journal maybe than the material engineering and everything that this implies. I think that's also very intriguing for me. Thank you. Respond about the question of publication. Nima? Uh, we're actually just, I'm just going to reflect on something that we have discussed before that uh, we we have some plans to, to like put this documentation and like have a publication. Of course, not in some uh, like materials engineering uh, journals. But uh, in more in the art side, I'd say, based on what we discussed, I don't exactly remember the journals that we've discussed before. But, uh, but yeah, this this would like uh, as one of the outputs that we're gonna have. Uh, it'll have a we would have a publication completely different in terms of the results, in terms of the uh, like the way we used to like share the outcomes outcomes of our research. And these this kind of properties, it requires us to to publish them in com in a completely different journal. Uh, do you have something? So I think that's a very good question because uh, that will be something new to us as a researcher to uh, to learn. Like basically, we ask ourselves um, through this project how we put things together and how we uh, learn from each other and what kind of expression we want to put what kind of message we would like to uh, give like from this uh, those works that we we, we have done so uh, and um, yes we are seeking for publication and uh, uh, I think that's the outcome and uh, the learning process also um, by putting things together, by uh, summarizing our our way of collab collaboration and uh, uh, the the expressions we want to we want to give the message we want to give give out. That's also a learning process and very valuable thing that we also learn from this this whole thing. Um, and uh, I think. Basically, uh, as a researcher, I, from my observation, I think um, one valuable thing that I think could be one of the outcome is that uh, we, we have this kind of material that has properties like this, like that, we can carry as with all these techniques. And what we want to, to do with this, to, to like making a robot, but, <laughs> suddenly it can talk and to interact with other like humans and and to 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 say something about itself so uh that's something very uh interesting and also reflecting how like art and science collaborate it with each other to put something alive yeah Um, yeah, I think also branching on that, it, it's, uh, it's always nice to be able to work in this kind of collaborative uh, scheme where it's, um, it's, it's a cross pollination of being able to, like, um, I don't know, uh, the way that an artist sort of animates an idea and brings it to life in a way that communicates differently than 
a scientific publication would. Uh, it's two very different ways of sort of um, interpreting the same information, just uh, delivered in different formats. And I think that's um, that's what's so nice about cross collaborating like this is the fact that um, yeah, we can all use our own languages for being able to um, communicate an idea and animate that in the world, but uh, but we can kind of um, work together to communicate the the best message possible, I guess, from it. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's all my thoughts. One interesting thing is when we talk about publication, since some of us would dream to make an exhibition in Centre Pompidou, that's the end goal, and some others would be advanced material journal. And I think what's interesting in terms of publication is like also considering what the end goals, of course, from each party, but also trying, there's more and more interest in new forms of publications. Uh, for instance, the able review able journal which which is like a scientific and artistic uh journal that's based on visuals and it's interesting because at, at first you might think that only artists would be interested with more and more and more scientists working with like strong images and objects wants to be published in that journal as well where there's actually no text like just a small description so that's kind of interesting also seeing what are the end goals but also not always separating these and trying to find a way where everyone is happy <laughs> in a way and uh i guess because we haven't said the big word research creation so i'm just saying research creation but uh, this interdisciplinary uh, I, alliance at some point also uh, are interested in what are the new kinds of publication in every way in which everyone would be like satisfied in a way but also that that kind of change the way we perceive what a publication is uh because in canada now an exhibition is a publication but in many other countries it's not so it's also interesting to see how the scientific knowledge and recognition change with the integration of art and science uh disciplines uh, all together Thank you. Uh, I totally resonate with what you said, and the the point that I want to bring up is is kind of the same direction. Uh, I see this challenging point uh, in organizing the the article and the publications, because uh, and specifically in interpreting the data that we have here, because we uh, engineers we used to like want to measure whatever we can measure, want to quantify them, and dealing with data is kind of more easier for us to to kind of interpret with our experiments into some conclusions and uh, i see this as a challenging point specifically for us to working with non uh numerical values and data and interpreting them into an, a valid conclusion i'd say Okay, that's the same question. Okay, I um I might have a follow up question on the question of data. Okay, because uh Nora, you, you work a lot with uh with data as well, uh human data, well numerical data which comes from human, uh and Jackie, you also have a whole work with data in DNA sequences, which deals with the, the human body as well. You work with different types of data, and and Brice also has uh different ways of working with the uh, with data, so I'm just I'm just uh, I just want to pick up on this on this thread of the invisible because I think this is what you're trying to do in different ways. Uh, this bringing invisible phenomena to the sense the sensorial realm, um, but I'm I'm just curious about the um, the ethics of working with data, and, and I'm not talking about your ethics protocol here at Concordia. I'm talking about like how, how you engage like with human participants. Uh, what kind of data do you keep? What kind of data do you leave aside and why? That would be my question. I don't know if someone wants to jump in. Okay. Yes, I actually think about this question a lot. Um, 
So we have a lot of devices now that capture our physiological data. So there's, you know, like the watches and, you know, there's a lot of like health related um, digital products on the market now that, um, yeah, where is our data going? <laughs> so, um, so this is interesting to me because if I'm using data, um, yeah, I, I have to, I have to answer that question for myself. I use my own data, so I do store my own data. Um, but when I've been doing, um, public exhibitions that use, someone else's data, uh, it is always streamed in real time. So I don't keep it. It's, um, and I think of this more like an energetic exchange that, you know, the, um, well, the data is just obviously the, the sort of the evidence of, uh, of your energy, but, you know, you, uh, when I'm in your presence, like we, you know, we share, we share this energy freely <laughs> with each other. And so I don't have an ethical qualm about asking if someone wants to participate and use a sensor and, you know, participate in the art, then they're just, they're allowing me this energetic exchange in the same way they, that they do anyway in in my in my presence um but in collaboration with scientists it becomes a different story where if you are going to use or capture people's data then um you know there will perhaps have to be a request to the ethics board to um to make sure that that's okay. So that's just something that I think about. And I also, you know, I talked to someone recently that the they're starting a whole um, company with an app that's going to capture physiological data and then like, uh, I guess, sell, sell it to uh, I don't know, various softwares. And now everybody will be able to make, uh, make work from the physiological data. So uh, beyond the ethics of it, I, I also kind of think of it as like, oh, the commoditization of, of data. This is kind of an interesting topic as well. Um, and also maybe a philosophical issue because, uh, um, you know, using people's data to make art, but without the sort of the per personal meaning, uh, like knowing like, oh, this is the, the, mm, not detritus, but like the manifestation material from another person. And, um, you know, so I, I think that the use of data, um, I like to, I like to keep it close to the, to the um, acknowledgement of their selfhood. And so that's what guides me in the use of data, that this is, um, it, the data does not define your selfhood, but uh, it, is an, it is the a material sort of evidence, uh, a material evidence of your selfhood. And I never want these two, um, these two ideas to be too far apart so that I don't start to commoditize myself or, or others for the sake of making um, artwork. So that's how I would answer that. Um, I'm going to have to adapt the definition of data a little bit to incorporate like people's uh, performances or more specifically their um, how they're portrayed, their portrayals in film and in documentary. Obviously, when you do a, a project, you get a media release, which basically entitles you to do whatever you want with the footage you have of them. But there's sort of some ethical issues with that. Like the reason reality TV shows that do sit down interviews with the cast members, they ask them to wear the same outfit every interview over the course of months so that they can basically edit them to say whatever the creators of the show want. Even they can make them look like a complete idiot. They can make them look really mean. Um, they can just misrepresent people. And it's just sort of part of the medium of creating a story. But I never, that didn't sit right with me. So I always want to like make sure that everyone that's in what I'm doing is cool with how they look. And it's tough because sometimes like, 
someone will make a point to say like that can't be in the film and it's like your favorite part because it's so real and it like it feels like like the they were burying their soul or something and that's like embarrassing so they don't want it in the film and then you have to say well okay i guess i'll cut it but it's it's worth it because you you don't want people to regret participating in uh, art Yeah, uh, data. It, I, I I really resonate with both of those actually. Um, I work with data. Uh, I work with open source data, genetic data specifically. Um, and I think for me, when I'm approaching using data, it's always trying to um, trying to understand where it comes from, what is it from, and what you're trying to say with it, especially in data visualization. It's um, how you portray that data or how it's being perceived. Um, as Jacob was talking about, it's like you're capturing a living thing and you're, you're sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's like archiving a fragment of that living thing. So um, how it's portrayed is, is essential. And uh and so, yeah, I think especially with like data visualization or with sort of storytelling with data, um, it's uh, you have to be incredibly conscious about how that data is used and how you're processing it and, and um, yeah, trying to be ethical in terms of what you're trying to say with it as well, because what you are using to say or the language that you're speaking through is a, a living thing um, with uh, agency and feelings. And um, so, yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of where I sit on data and like how it's used. Yeah, Gabriel is looking at me because <laughs> we're having, uh, I don't know what a data is anymore. I'm like lost because of Gabriel. Uh, also because we have like so many different definitions uh, from the outside and the scientific side. And then I will just say information, right? Uh, but um, I guess, I guess just, just, just to bounce back on what Jackie said, uh, especially from the field of design and arts where we work a lot with information and we have our data we have a responsibility because our, our work is kind of translating things that can be abstract for us uh, into something that's an object that's an image that's a sculpture and then there's a there, there there's a big responsibility because it's it's an aesthetical point of view that people will get in relation with and then there's there's a lot of bias into that right uh, and uh, and that, um, if we take air quality for instance and that's also a big question that 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 we have in 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 the project that Alice is is leading uh how do you represent air quality is is red means that it's bad uh, i mean Red never decided that it was a bad person, right? And uh, Green never decided it was a good person as well. Uh, so all these concepts that we're working with and all these aesthetical tools are like kind of the more I get into it and the more I'm I'm like, who's going to look at this? And what has, what's the responsibility of you representing things that sometimes you don't even have the knowledge to understand, right? Because when you're a designer and you're working with... I don't know, for scientists, for instance, and you have to represent something, you don't have the first knowledge to kind of understand what you're doing. And in the meantime, you have sometimes to synthesize things. So that's the designer talking now. Uh, so the, the more I get into it and the more I feel like it's dangerous. Uh, so so I, my relation with that is, is quite um, uh, troublesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'd like to hear you actually about like right. <laughs> like scientific research. Yeah. Data. Yes, we uh we need to be very careful about uh, the data we collect. Uh, we uh, draw clear um 
assumptions when we do, for example, measurements? Is it in under what kind of uh, factors are affecting this experiment? And then we interpret with uh, everything together. And uh, yes, and repeat, that's that's essential. We don't rely on just one time like miracle, right? Uh, but in terms of like art and science collaboration, I think um, data for me in this project, it's uh, we remember the path, like how things develop um, during uh, we create the, the, the final outcome. For example, um, I take pictures um, when they, even though it's just it's a totally failure, but I still take pictures to 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 know that what lead to those uh, results. And uh, also, Jacob <laughs> helped a lot about like a document and uh, everything. Uh, we look back and uh, think about what we can do to help to improve this 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 material or, or the final the, the product. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, my relationship with data, it's a bit easier <laughs> to <compare> with you. <laughs> but yes, I totally agree that we need to be very careful when we need a collect, handle, and interpret data, no matter if it's for scientific research or it's for like final, a more uh, beauty or art uh, product. <laughs> In the same direction, I just have a question. Uh, do you think that the data selection in in the art field is is it has more flexibility compared to science? Because well, when we we're doing a study, when we we're like doing uh, for the sake of the reliability of the study, we we're uh, running experiments in different replica, and uh, if the results that we're getting is not of our interest or what we is not in the, aligned with our first proposal, we still should report it. We can't remove those data it's, as long as we want to have a reliable research. But because uh, we have a modeling, we want to just model a specific situation that has something to do with the real situation. And then we want to conclude about the results that we're getting about the actual situation. But in art, since we have just a content that we want to create something new, we're not probably do any modeling. I'm not sure, I'm not just asking. Do you think that if there is any like uh, more flexibility in data selection in art field? There's a few. A hundred percent. So uh, for instance, um, Okay, so it gets back to what the maybe the aim of the work is. If the aim is uh, you you want to you want to find a fact, then your data is absolutely crucial in narrowing down deductively so that you can produce a fact. But if you're trying to produce a feeling, well, so for instance, mm, so EEG, uh, like brain sensors, um, they're notorious, that uh, they're <laughs> very sensitive, so they don't like when you move around, they don't, it, you know, it produces a lot of noise in the data. So ordinarily, you would probably go to town cleaning this data to make sure that you took out the data that registered your eye blinking. I mean, it's very sensitive, right, these sensors. So, um, but my my aim would be to uh, use to program the data and scale the numbers in such a way that you're using it the data as material and the material has to produce a, a desired result. So if the desired result is to say have people feel more relaxed, slow down their system, then it does not matter whether the data is noisy. The, it matters that the data is present uh, because it's it's an the point is more that it is an an 
interaction between the person, their their body or their data, and the work, and that it has to have that desired uh, that desired outcome, and that that is verified through the reporting of the participant. So, but if the sensor is producing noisy data, it's that's something that's resolved pro programmatically within the software. And because I'm not, I don't need the data to reveal a particular fact. So that's, that's how I would answer. Andres, do you want to add something? Yeah, I would say that in, in many cases, it's pretextual, the fact of using data, because it's in in many applications, in arts applications, I mean, in artworks, it's sometimes there's an interesting dynamic into using data, right? From something that's moving, it can like, there's, I think there's many ways of using them. And I will bounce on something different. Uh, if we make an experimentation, like let's say we put people visitors in front of an artwork and we make a survey to understand oh they react to that artwork then we're trying to make a point right because then we fall into the survey and to the way of collecting data just as a social scientist would do and then analyzing these relations right so it's a way we can also collect data in art or in design by making user user experiences but in other cases, when we're using sensors, we're not interested in how accurate it is. We're also interested in all the different dynamics that it can create. And uh, and I think the aesthetical point of view of this data and understanding that also things are moving, things are not constant. And uh, and 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 um, in my presentation, I was talking about amplifying things that are around. So I will take again i think the example of air quality because i think it's very relevant but when you're talking about things that you cannot grasp and that you cannot experience then you don't really care how accurate has the data has to be you need at some point to translate the fact that there's so much particle in the air that it can be harmful and then you have to find a good way of translating this so if it's like on the scale from one to 10 and 10 being very bad, you don't really care if it's eight or nine or 8.001. You're just like, okay, now it's harmful. So how do I translate it? So we also have a way of fixing our own boundaries, I guess. And we also do it in collaboration because we, 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 I think what's, what would be dangerous is us considering that we have an accurate uh, knowledge and an accurate way of you know analyzing this data so i think it's it also lies in the fact that we have to put our own limits and and our limits are like constrained to our language right and, uh, and to to our understanding also and then of of what data is uh, and and i think that's the art side meanwhile the design side is is really different from the art one because it, it's it's i think it's much more uh, constraining. Uh, I mean, as a designer, when I work uh, with as for doing visualization on data, then the client is really like looking at what you're doing. So then you enter in collaboration with people that are specialized into it because you're representing something, but you have to do it the right way. Meanwhile, art can be more like pretextual also, but also accurate. It's, it's, it's there's so many different ways of tackling the subject. So that's. Uh, so, so interesting. Well, thank you. I think we have a question here. Hello, uh, thank you for the, the talk. It was really interesting. Again, and uh, my question is again in relation to um, the scientific, I don't, don't want to say versus the arts, but and the arts. But um, I was wondering because there's different terminologies for scientific research and for artistic practices and i was wondering how do you navigate this uh, for example uh, we can talk about uh, users for design or like participants for maybe a, um, a scientific approach uh, or audience for uh, artistic uh, practice so i was wondering how do you navigate through all this terminology an easy question <laughs> Answer. 
So Thank like, you. <laughs> I learned from my supervisor, Professor Matis Ruti, like uh, since the first day of my PhD, uh, she has trying like to let us explain things to a 12 year old kid. So we need to absorb the 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 core or the fact that the elements of the scientific terms or technology and we need to find our way to to express that, that in the simple term that re that training really helped me to uh to explain the uh, uh, scientific idea graphene uh, or like responsiveness to uh, our artists also like during this exhibition to general public or even like preliminary school <laughs> kids i think um just one thing that, that I, I really appreciate that and one thing that i learned also like maybe future if, if like in 10 years 20 years I, to my kids to my students i would say i would do the same basically like use human language <laughs> like to communicate to to understand each other even though it's science it's just it's it's science it's a it's a thing like a thing can be translate or like uh, explain like yeah so um yeah like i think thanks to that i i, I find it uh, a smooth conversation can be really <laughs> to to do that like with our within our team and uh, also for our our artists they use uh they try in the same way i think like to, to help us to understand uh the our art art side of of like our purpose, what we want to achieve, and also like for Jacob, like try to teach us what's what's the <laughs> the movie content, and uh, yeah, we learned a lot with each other. I think. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting that you talk about the supervisor because uh, I th I think it's it's a lot about knowing who you are what you're doing what you're expert in and not not putting yourself in a position that you're not i'm talking about the supervisor <laughs> because when i started my thesis and being interesting in materials at some point you're like okay i mean i'm into science material that's awesome right? and then at some point your supervisor is like no you're an artist you know that's that's who you are and then you can have an understanding of other things but you have to know where are your limits it's just like this data talk we just had like where where are your limits? I'm an artist and I will never be a material scientist, even though I love that field. So I think the way of navigating is also understanding where are your boundaries and where are others' boundaries and also legitimizing yourself that you're an artist at university and that's cool too. I think that's that's something hard also like, uh, I mean, in France, it hasn't been from for a long time that art practices are into the academic and recognize as a research uh, discipline. So it's hard also to legitimize yourself. And sometimes you it's artists tends to, you know, blend themselves with other disciplines, but I guess it's also for recognition, M maybe. I mean, that's my own analysis. There's no real data on, on that, but uh, that's, my <laughs> that's my point of view. Well, thank you, everybody. It was really an interesting discussion. I feel like somehow this project has helped. At, I mean, I know Nima and Ewan <laughs> better than anyone, anyone else, but so I'll speak for them, but I, I don't know where the others started from, but I think it has helped us, let's say, uh, evolve. And um, one thing I noticed in this panel that I was really impressed by is how you guys have all been able to reflect on science and art and this collaboration and create a narrative that is not um, usual, I would say, like, at least, I don't know how it is in the, in the art field, but in the material science, but especially engineering field, students rarely have to have this sort of reflective discussions right you always speak about oh 
here is what I've done. Here is what I want to do. Here is what I need to solve, you know, and, but why am I doing what I'm doing, which is kind of what has been discussed throughout and, and what are the challenges of doing what I'm doing in a more philosophical way. It's something that in my department, we would have never discussed among students. And here I feel like it was a very rich discussion and you all brought really interesting points and you were interacting with each other, asking questions, right? So I was very impressed by this. And I think it's one of the um, uh, points that haven't reached us. And again, I speak for us, I don't know if it's the same or not in the, in the design and art field. But uh, so again, thank you everybody. Thank you for participating and uh, look forward to continuing this work with everyone. Okay, hey, thank you everyone for, for all from the reactive graphene oxide residency for bringing this widescreen view of the nanomaterial and sort of your folding together of material science design in our practice is really great. Really appreciate bringing that here to Force Space. Thank you also for all the great questions. We'll be closing up the Zoom and the live stream now, but just a quick reminder, this is already available on our YouTube channel, so you can go home and watch it or revisit and share later. But please join us again for the next event that's part of the Milieu Residency, The Commons, which is a workshop and a video game activity with PhD student Christian Scott. So thank you again and hope to see you soon. Bye. Good job, good job.